sitting here that attend the Thrive Groups are benefiting from them, so just ask around if you have any questions. And then also, we have many, many opportunities to serve at the church, and so if you have it on your heart to serve at all, feel free to stop by the Connect Center, see where the needs are. Uh, we can point you to a ministry leader, we can point you to a ministry that definitely needs service, and one of the ministries that we can definitely use help with now is the hospitality ministry, the food ministry, the setup and the tear down of this wonderful uh, food that we have every single week. So if you feel it on your heart to serve there, please let somebody know, sign up for the Connect Center. And with that, you'll bow your heads with me, and let's uh, come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, come here, to grow, to uh, love on one another, to serve one another, and to hear you, Lord. I pray that we come today with our glass empty, Lord, that we would fill up today and that we would get in that routine, Lord. Help us to, to um, just draw near to you and you'll draw near to us so we can fill up our cups, we can empty our cups out, Lord. Help us to just be a leaky vessel. Everything we fill up, let's pour out on others. As uh, we worship today, we ask that you hear our voices uh, loud and lifted up. We pray for the message that Pastor Jason is going to deliver today. And um, we just ask that you be here and be present. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's continue to honor him and praise him, lift up his name. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations. With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King conquer the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the 
the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You're worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Then you would take my place. Then you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I'll sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Then you would take my place. Then you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. jealous he is jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us Oh, how He loves us so. Oh, how He loves us. How He loves us so. Yes, He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. 
to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss in my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about oh the way yes he loves us oh well he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. Oh, how he loves. Oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Great are 
Is the Lord and greatly to be praised and sometimes during worship I just feel like I'm just getting a glimpse just a, a small sliver through the crack of the glimpse of the glory of God and, and, and the Bible says that we can't fully see the glory of God we couldn't in this state see his full glory. Even Moses, he asked, God, let me see your glory. I'm going on behalf of you. I'm speaking on behalf of you. Let me now see your glory in fullness. And, and God said, you can't see my glory fully and live. Well, one day we will. And sometimes in life, we could get so burdened down with the cares of this world or the day-to-day -day or, or the struggles or the sorrows or the pains. And, and, and we could get so foggy and, and, and so foggy from the things of God, and, and God can feel so distant in our life, but yet when we come back and praise, I feel again and again, sometimes I see, oh, it's, it's becoming more clear. I'm seeing that glimpse, just a glimpse of God's glory. And Lord, we ask that you would be here this morning, God, that we could glimpse your glory in a fuller measure. God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, as you often spoke about and prayed for those that would hear when you spoke, when you were here on this earth that you spoke, and you would say, give them ears to hear. God, that we would have ears to hear your word. God, that we would have eyes to see your glory and the beauty of the Lord, that we would behold that, that, that we would inquire in your temple, God, all the days of our life, they are before you, and they are a vapor. God, and I pray that you would help us to see this morning. Give us fresh eyes, Lord, a fresh heart, a clear mind, that we would love you with all of our mind, soul, and strength. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and uh, greet one another, say hello. Morning.
Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Calvary San Mateo. Great to see everybody. If you need a Bible, uh, raise your hand and we will get you a Bible. Michael J. Franks, uh, passing out the Bibles. Thank you. Good to see everyone this morning. Um, I don't know if you've had a busy week, good week. Hopefully you had a good 4th of July. Got some time to rest and get off work and, and hang out with family and friends and uh, eat some good food, barbecue, all those good things that we uh, love to do around this time, enjoy summer. It's been a busy week. Uh, for us, it's been very busy. As you, you know, a lot of us, uh, or a lot of you know, we moved recently and uh, it was great getting in a new place, super blessed. God is uh, very good to us. And um, a friend uh, shared this with me. There's a, a Christian uh, satire site called the Babylon Bee. I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, I just, it, it was just so funny. It, it always kind of hits close to home, some of the articles they have. And uh, one was, uh, it's fake, it's satire, but... Um, it's super on point. <laughs> and one of them hit especially close to home with our move. And it was uh, uh, titled, um, the article is titled, Bear One Another's Burdens, Sermon is Suspiciously Close to Pastor's Moving Date. <laughs> and uh, it says, uh, Pastor Steve Zaxby preached a, sur- a stirring sermon on bearing one another's burdens on Sunday at Harvest Bible Fellowship's morning service. Just as the leader prepared to move to his new home across town, sources confirmed Friday. <laughs> Bear one another's burdens, beloved. An unusually passionate <laughs> Zagsby reportedly implored his flock as he dove headlong into Galatians 6.2. Let's really live this out. Maybe you can talk to a friend that is struggling or help a beloved individual in your church move their sofa and all their heavy bookshelves. <laughs> what a great application of this verse. Zagsby is said to have also identified several common burdens individuals struggle with, <laughs> including insecurity, depression, loneliness, and, re- <laughs> and realizing you've hardly done any packing despite the fact you have to be out of your current house in less than a week. <laughs> Additionally, to really drive home his point, Pastor Zagsby asked the congregation to write on a connection card one or two things they would commit to during this week in order to bear someone's burden, and drop those cards in the offering plate along with whether or not they were free on Saturday and or had a pickup truck available. <laughs> so it was, just, it was uh, very close, and I didn't, never preached on Galatians 6.2, uh, but we did have a lot of help, and we were super blessed, so uh, thanks to so many. Yeah, it was, and I couldn't get that article out of my head, I just, uh, and I was uh, dying uh, of uh, just laughing at it, so I figured I'd share a little bit with you. So... Uh, we are in uh, the series going through the book of John uh, still this morning. Uh, we've been careening right through, and we are already uh, after 45 weeks in John chapter 11. Uh, we are in verse 17 this morning is where we'll start, and the series uh, that you may believe, and that believing you may have life in his name. It's the purpose for which John wrote this book, and uh, if we could stand as we read John 17 through 44, good healthy chunk of verses this morning. 17 says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she sent and met with him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she arose quickly and went to him. 
Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When, Jesus, when the Jews heard, or the, when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of some blind man have also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Father, we thank you for this word. God, we thank you for this story. God, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Father, we pray that you bless it this morning in our ears, to our souls, and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may have a seat. This morning is uh, the title, Rise and Shine and Give God the Glory. Glory. Rise and Shine. And uh, I don't know if you ever need help rising uh, in the morning. Uh, I know sometimes I could use the help. So I'm going to give you quick eight tips to help you wake up faster uh, that I read. Is, is one is uh, to assess your health. It says just to make sure you're eating good and kind of getting some exercise. Those are fairly important. Uh, two was keep a drink by your bedside. So I actually tried this uh, last night. And this morning, keep a drink by your bedside, so it's good to roll over and take a drink of water, really helps get things going. Three is place an alarm clock strategically, so like far away, uh, which is a good idea. It may, may infuriate you from time to time, but instead of you place it across the room so you have to get up and go to it, it actually helps you wake up because you can't just hit snooze if it's right there uh, by your bed. Uh, four was get an alarm clock that lights up, uh, light helps you wake up. Uh, five uh, is download the Spin Me app. So there's an app that's an alarm, and you actually can't just snooze it off. You actually have to get up and spin around two times for it to turn off. <laughs> My wife walked in on me this morning spinning, and just she's like, all right, you're spinning. Um, don't drink caffeine or alcohol the night before. Could help. Uh, try smelling salts. So apparently this has been working for hundreds of years. And the eighth tip is to train yourself. Uh, don't just force yourself, but to train yourself. It actually said that if you, in midday, uh, practice getting up right away, like, I wake up, get up. Like it said practice that 10 times a day until it just becomes uh, a habit. So uh, anyway, uh, if you ever need help rising, uh, that would help you there. And of course, the rising that we're talking about this morning is much more than just waking up from sleep, as some had, had thought. Uh, we're in the story of Lazarus, and Lazarus died. And if you remember last week, Jesus, um, uh, he waited a few days. And, and this rising, of course, is very different than just waking up. And it is to show that uh, Lazarus was actually dead, and that when Jesus would bring him back to life, that God would be glorified. So he will rise, shine, and it will give God the glory, glory. And um, hopping right into uh, verse 17, where we're at here, it says, uh, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. So remember last week that Jesus hears the news about his friend, Lazarus, being ill. It's a sickness that was, death was imminent. Apparently, 
Um, and so he gets a word from a messenger, probably about a day's trip. So Lazarus had probably died before the messenger got to Jesus. And Jesus says, oh, the, the message was, hey, come quickly, Jesus. Your friend Lazarus is going to die. And Jesus waits two days uh, extra, then another day to, to go there. Uh, so a day for the messenger, two days he waits, and another day to go to Lazarus. So now it's been four days when Jesus gets there. But he wanted there to be no doubts that Lazarus was dead. He, he didn't want this miracle to be explained away. Uh, you can watch a lot of things um, that are on like uh, the History Channel and such about uh, how the 10 plagues of Egypt, they, they, there's natural phenomenon that can kind of mimic some of those things and they, they try and explain uh, miracles away often. But Jesus wanted no doubts here. He, there wasn't a way to clinically prove someone was dead. They didn't have the equipment we have uh, today where they could mark the time and date of death. So uh, and there was a belief, the Jews believed that the, when, you're, when someone died, that the spirit hovered around the person for about three days trying to get back into the person. And then the fourth day when the body was obviously decomposing and liquefying that, uh, okay, the spirit wasn't going to get back in and they were actually dead. So Jesus wants it to be that, that he wasn't just swooning. There was a theory that people thought, oh, well, they were close to death. They were swooning. It seemed like they were dead. And then they came up, um, but he waits uh, these extra days so that there would be no doubt about Lazarus uh, being uh, all the way dead, not just uh, mostly dead. <laughs> so, glad you caught that. So, verse, uh, verse 18, it says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So many people were coming from Jerusalem. There was a, a much bustle, and, and this, this news had spread about Lazarus. So it's telling you that this family uh, was probably a prominent family. They were probably uh, influential, maybe uh, a little wealthy. And uh, it was customary to bury the dead person on the day of their death, and then a funeral um, would, would happen, and then there would be a 30-day period of mourning. So there'd be 30 days kind of marked out to mourn what had happened. And we, today we have funerals, and then mourning kind of carries on, but there's no, um, uh, you know, like formal 30-day thing. Um, of course, the grief comes wave by wave and all the time, but this was like a formal day period, and the first seven days of this period was very intense. The mourning was... Um, it was just specifically supposed to be intense after this person had passed. There would be professional wailers hired that would mourn, and they would be, you know, wailing away and helping this whole thing. Um, so no one would eat a lot because it was just, so we're going to focus on the mourning here. And so Jesus comes right in the middle of this uh, on the fourth day. And then, um, so... Verse 20, Mary, now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met with him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died, but even now I know that whatever you ask, God will give to you. And, and so Martha, kind of like her personality in Luke 10, she's a hustling and bustling, she's doing stuff, and Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet, if you recall that story. And so this is her personality, she hears Jesus coming, she can't sit still, and she goes to meet Jesus before he gets to the city. And she does address him with the right term, Lord, Lord. And she doesn't chastise him here, she knows he's Lord, uh, but she says, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. And that's why we called you. If you had been here, if you had maybe come quicker, not waited the two days extra, my brother would have not died. But then she says with her perspective, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She had, this was, these were close friends of Jesus. She knew Jesus, was discipled by Jesus. And you could tell that she knows that she, Jesus will be heard by God and whatever he asks, God will do. And, and so she apparently had the faith that, that Jesus could have healed Lazarus, but, but she wasn't thinking that he could possibly raise Lazarus from the dead. The thought may have, have, have not um, entered her mind because it is a miracle. This is uh, the, one of the eight signs Jesus does in John, the last one he does actually, and it is uh, like the capstone of all the signs that he does. 
Uh, this has never been done in such a way where he raises someone from the dead. It is a spoiler alert for things to come. It is a, a preview of coming attractions, if you will. And so Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And of course, he meant uh, imminently, immediately uh, coming, he will rise again. And Martha, keen insight, she says, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And um, he meant now, but, but she didn't realize that. But she, did, she does have some good theology going on. Uh, she realizes that this is what the Bible taught even in the Old Testament. Uh, Job 19, 25 and 26 says, uh, Job says this, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Profound uh, picture of resurrection in the Old Testament. You might not have thought there was resurrection in the Old Testament taught, but there is. Psalm 1610 says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol or in, or in, in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So speaking, hinting at the resurrection. And Daniel 12, 2 says, And of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, they shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so, after all, Jesus discipled, uh, no doubt, Lazarus and Mary and Martha. So she had good theology. She knew what was to come. And that's one of the things I love about uh, Calvary chapels for the most part is when we go verse by verse through the word and, and look at everything, we get a good uh, understanding of who God is. We get a good theology. We speak as the Bible speaks. We don't want to hone in on certain aspects that are very important, but they could be overemphasized when we want to speak as, as the, the Bible speaks. And um, Calvary chapels are great discipling churches. You, you know, that's why I love Calvary, grew much myself just hearing the word of God taught verse by verse, line upon line. And hopefully God is giving a, a hunger and a thirst for the word in, in your own life. Uh, to spend time with the Lord uh, on, on your own day to day and to seek him uh, there. So um, all this is part of the first point. Uh, three points this morning quickly that we will uh, go through. Uh, and the first that we're in right now is uh, it's now and then. It's now and then. See, uh, the resurrection, she was like, oh, that's, that's something to come at, at the end. It's, it's a far off. But Jesus, in verse 25, uh, drops uh, this verse, which is uh, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Uh, verse 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And I love this verse, this, this uh, oft-quoted verse at, at funerals or at times of grief. What a promise that we have in this verse. I love the way it's worded. I love the, the phrasing of this verse because it doesn't, it doesn't just minimize death as as, as a fairy tale. It doesn't minimize death as something that doesn't really happen. It does. It's something we must pass through. And though we die, yet shall we live. The promise that Jesus gives in this verse. And so, it's not only about uh, then, when we die, when, when we get to heaven, all those things, but it's, it's now. She's thinking the resurrection is afar off. He's saying, hey look, I am the resurrection and the life. And of course, he uses the phrase, I am, Hinting at Exodus 3.15, when, when God said, I am that I am. That, that's the name of God. One of the, the, the best ways to kind of articulate God, who, who we can't fully ever understand because he's, he's infinite. We have finite understanding of all things, or of some things, not even all things. And so, I am that I am is the phrase, I think, that best describes God. He's the all-present one. He's the eternally existent one. There, there is no beginning to him. There is no end. He's outside of the time-space continuum. He is the I am. This is the fifth of seven I am statements that Jesus makes here in the book of John. I am. He is the one who was and is and is to come. And it's a relationship. It's knowing Christ. 
now, the Christian life. It's, it's not then, it's now. A, a, a lot of people that would claim to, to, to be religious or have a faith, they'll, they'll oh, you, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And that's, that's about all they want to do with God. But in this life, there is no relationship. There is no walking with God day to day. But that's what Christianity is about. It's about knowing God now. Experiencing God now. He's the I am, the resurrection and the life now. There was various philosophies, it still is. Uh, Socrates, uh, I heard on his deathbed, was asked, shall we live again? And his answer was, I hope so, but no one can know for sure. And Jesus, with this promise, this bold claim here, with, and no doubt to give evidence to back it up, says, I am the resurrection and the life. And what a beautiful verse that we have here, that it's worded that we pass through death to life. 1 Corinthians 15 says, O death, where is your victory? O hell, where is your sting? Of course, it's been removed. And then he asks her, do you believe this? Do you believe this? The question that goes out, the question most fitting for this bold claim that Jesus gives, this invitation, if you will, is that do you believe this? Do you believe this? The question that no doubt is the most important question that we can answer. Do you believe this? And he says to Martha and to Mary that if they believe, they will see great things. And her answer, verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And her answer is right on. She says, yes, yes, I believe. She says, yes, Lord, calling him Lord, Master, King, Lord of Lord, King of Kings. I believe, the, the Greek word for believe is the faith, trust, hope. It's all those things boiled in. She trusts in this. She trusts in Christ. And ultimately, we all trust in something. We all uh, put our hope in something or our understanding rests somewhere in something or someone. And Jesus is saying to believe upon His words. He is the resurrection and the life. She calls Him the Christ, which is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One who was promised in the Old Testament. So, Son of God, You are the Christ. The Son of, she's getting them all thrown in there. Lord, Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. So she's covering all her bases. Yes, Lord, I believe You're the Christ, the Son of God, the One who is coming into the world, the One who is sent. And that is... The right answer when asked that question, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and the one coming into the world. And, and the Bible says right here that as we will get to that, if you believe, you will see great things. You will see great things. A verse I remember uh, before I went on my first mission trip to uh, Philly uh, in, in a, the training camp, and I was, remember having a Devo and reading in John chapter 2 or John chapter 1 at the end, and, and that same question was asked to Nathaniel. You, you know, Jesus said, hey, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? He said, that's it? You, you know, I just said that, and you believe. He's like, you're going to see greater things than these. And I remember God speaking that verse into my life that in he spoke to me in that moment, in that, that Devo, and then someone else brought it up in the message, and I was like, yes, this is, God, this is what you are saying, and you will see greater things than these, and surely on that trip, the things that God did in my heart and in my life and before my eyes were amazing, amazing. In verse 28, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. So she has this encounter with Jesus outside of the town. She went to meet him. Now she goes and runs back and she gets her sister, uh, uh, siblings. They, they got to talk. They got to, you know, uh, it's great when siblings can have that relationship where they confide in one another. They tell each other things before they tell anyone else. It's kind of the relationship that they have going on here. Um, probably some fighting and all those things that go on as well. But 
uh, in maturity. Hopefully these things come. And she goes and tells Mary, her sister, and uh, it kind of in private and, and said, the teacher is calling for you. So apparently Jesus said, hey, I want to speak to Mary as well. I know she has the same questions as you, and uh, I'll also I know all things. So when she had heard it, she went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, he, but, but he was still uh, on his way and in the place where Martha had met him. And then when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. So she goes, she tells her sister, Mary gets up, and she goes to Jesus. So Mary, kind of the quieter one, maybe a little more introverted, Martha a little extroverted. Mary was just uh, you know, grieving, and Martha comes, hey, Jesus is on his way. I just spoke with him. I've come back. Apparently, she's a little faster than Jesus. And she says, hey, I, he, wants to, he wants to meet with you as well. So she gets up and she goes. And the mourners, those that were around her, are thinking she's going to the tomb uh, to, to weep again. And there's a lot of weeping going on. Remember, there's a lot of mourning going on in this whole scene. And she goes to meet with Jesus and she sees him and she falls at his feet. Uh, Mary, uh, probably the more emotional one, uh, you know, th- three boys, they're all very different. Some are way more emotional, dramatic than others. Some uh, not so much. Some more active, some more introverted, more extroverted, all kinds of different things. So Mary, a little more emotional. She falls at his feet just in seeing Jesus and seeing, probably hadn't seen him in a while and everything going on. Here's a familiar face and it's Jesus and, 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 and she she knows somewhat of, of who he is uh, by her, her sentence here. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Saying the same thing Martha said, no doubt they had discussed this. They had said, if only Jesus was here. Surely they sat and they wept together and said, if only Jesus had been here. And, and she says that to him. And, and so tell, tell God your true feelings. Tell God uh, what's going on in your life when when uh, you have questions and when you have things happening. Lord, if you had done this, God, I want to see you do this. And verse 33 says, When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. So there's weeping going on. There's, there's people wailing loudly. And if you've ever... Uh, uh, the raw emotion that comes at a time like this is, is pretty intense. When, when people are deeply uh, impacted by death, by a life being uh, taken, it's, it is a, a moment where you walk very softly. You listen and you try and, and be there. And Jesus is here and he says... Um, deeply moved and greatly troubled, and he says, where, where have you laid him? So Jesus steps into the scene of, of mourning, of despair, perhaps. Maybe, maybe uh, despair that is uh, lacking, lacking hope. And, and he's greatly moved in his spirit. The Greek word here for him being moved uh, means literally uh, to snort like a horse. Uh, so just the you know, whatever a horse does, you know, or flows through its nostrils. I don't want to try and do that right now. Um, it might get messy. But he, he's troubled here. He's greatly moved. And he sees um, what death has, has brought. He sees the emotion. Uh, sometimes stepping into that scene and seeing. I, I recall um, a young man. Uh, young man's funeral that I did, and uh, I hadn't seen him in a while, and I was a, I was I was sad, of course. I was sad. I was when I heard it was a shock, and then there was some, you know, of course denial, and then some anger. And but I, I didn't. I remember I was like I haven't really grieved, but when I went to the funeral to do the funeral, it was it was an open casket, and when I saw him, it that's that's when it it hit me and just the emotion hit me and oh my gosh here's his his tent here's his his body that is here and his soul no longer there in that lifeless body so jesus seeing all these things and walking into this scene he says 
So he's greatly troubled and, and distressed. He's deeply moved and, um, and he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And, and verse 35 says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Um, brings us to our second point through these verses is that uh, Jesus was moved deep and he still weeps. That he was, he, he was deeply moved. And this is interesting because this is juxtaposed to what he is about to perform. What he has just said, I am the resurrection and the life. And the miracle that he's about to perform, as we all know, so it's not too much of a spoiler alert that he raises Lazarus from the dead. But this is right in the middle of that. This promise he gives. Right? Sometimes we give a promise. Hey, rejoice in the Lord. Always rejoice. We give these promises. And, and, and sometimes, um, you know, we can wonder, but why is there still sadness. It's like, look, he just gave this promise and he knows what he's about to perform. And in the midst of this, we see the humanity of Jesus on display, I think, in a, a, a very beautiful and telling way that Jesus wept. This is the shortest verse in the Bible, yet it was packed with so much rich meaning. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of the, what was called the Prince of Preachers, he preached two whole sermons on these two words. Talk about going through the book of John slow. Uh, we, we ain't doing that. We're covering a lot of ground here. But he, he, two sermons on these two words because they're pregnant with meaning. And, and these, this word weep that is used here in the Greek is, is not used anywhere else in the, in the Bible. Uh, the other words for weeping uh, are a different Greek word around the other people wailing and, uh, wailing and weeping. It's, a different, it's more of a, a loud lamenting and a, and a uh, maybe performance or just a louder thing, but this Greek word is different than all the other words for weeping. It's dakruo, and it's not a wailing, but it's a silently bursting into tears. I don't know if you've ever seen this, when someone just silently to themselves bursts into tears, and, and, and they're in their moment, and they're weeping deeply, and this is the Lord of all life, the creator of all things, weeping for his friend. Weeping for his friend. How can you not love this? And to stop and think right now about what's going on. You have Jesus Christ, the author of all life, who's just given the, the promise that he is the resurrection and the life. Though you die, you will live again in, in Christ and though he knows what he's going to do, that he's going to raise Lazarus back from the dead, he, he weeps to stop and think about what this means. And I think in this moment that Jesus being in the form of God, being God wrapped in skin, that in this moment he saw all the devastation that sin and death would bring in this life. He just saw it all. Sometimes when I think about this, of what he must have just seen in that moment, of course it's his friend as well, and but just kind of stepping back and, and seeing all the devastation that will impact everybody who ever lives of sin and death and despair. He, he saw that in this moment, and I believe even the Son of God in His humanity here is weeping. It's a silent, inward, deeply moved and still weeping even though He knows who He is and what's, what He's going to do. I think of, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, it's getting older now. Uh, there was a movie called uh, Fifth Element uh, with Bruce Willis and there is a, a, a woman in the movie and, and she's learning about humanity. And I remember one of the scenes that always stuck with me is she's kind of, I guess, Googling before Google uh, this, you know, and she's looking at stuff on a screen and just like learning about human life. And then I think she's going through the alphabet and she gets to W, she gets to war. And it just starts showing all this crazy, all this stuff and the horrific things people have done to one another and all this death and despair that through the ages that's impacted so much. And I just remember she is just in that moment. This, why? Why help these people? Like look at the devastation. Look at all the despair. 
So God enters into the sorrows of those he loves. Don't you love this about Christianity? That God, that's on the message, the Bible is that God enters into the sorrow of those he loves. Isaiah 53 says that, speaking of Jesus in the Old Testament, says that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Think about if you could know everything. If you knew everything that, about everybody, everything that everyone was going through, how could you not be a man of sorrows acquainted with grief? Right? I know everyone, like social media, like people put on their best, and sometimes you're following someone on Instagram, you're like, man, their life is fantastic, you know? Look at all this stuff. There's been times where, they're, you know, I've been like, man, so many good things have happened, and I've, that same person, I've talked with them and met with them, and, and, and they've been like, oh, man, life's crazy. It's horrible. I'm going through this. I'm like, it looks a lot different than your Instagram. Like, you know, of course, we want to put that best face forward, and life is the greatest, and, and we have the greatest going on. But we all know that there's struggles underneath. There's, there's, there's issues. We're all broken. We're all going through it. And to think that Jesus can see all of that and knows all of that. Think if everyone was entirely, completely honest on social media, some of the posts. It would probably be a lot uh, more depressing than it is with the political debates. So, sometimes just watching the news, I just want to curl up and weep sometimes. When, when, you, look at the despair, when you look at the things going on and, 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 and all that can take place, a lot of people I know, they don't even like to watch the news because it's, it's so depressing from time to time. And, and, and Jesus felt this pain. The, the Hebrews 4 says he was, he was a high priest that can sympathize with our weaknesses. And being in ministry, you, you definitely feel this from time to time. You, you get more calls when stuff hits the fan in people's lives and and, and the realness, and that's a great thing. It's, it's a beauty of ministry. Surely you can't bear it on your own. You must pass that on to the Lord who can, but you see it more. When, when, when you serve God in that way, the realness and people's troubles will come to you, and you want that. That's why you're in ministry. It's why we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, because that's a, the real things going on in people's lives. Sometimes it's just a fake plastic smile that we can put on, but no, 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 give me the real. What's really going on? Give me the real download because we want to bring that to the Lord. We want to see God do a work in your heart and life through that and restore in and through that. And so sometimes you, you get that. I actually had a friend that, that she, uh, she said uh, she likes to hang out with us and, and, and like, you know, party with us and have a good time and, you know, She's like, that's why I don't go to your church. <laughs> like, I, I like to hang out and party. You know, I don't want to be bringing you all this stuff and then trying to have a good time. And it's like, sometimes in ministry, that's how it is. You always get the calls of like, oh, let's hang out and do this and have a good time. It's like, hey, I need help. Hey, I'm going through this. Hey, there's this. And of course, that's what ministry is for. That's why we're here. And Jesus, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, but in the midst of this, God is for life. And John has been telling us thus, this in so many words in, in one four that in him was life and the life was the light of man. And in John 3.16, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In John 6, I am the bread of life. In John 10, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, li- to, come to give life and to give it to the full, to give abundant life. Life, so he is for life. That life, that Greek that he uses in John is the zoe. It's not the bios, the biological life, or the suke, the psychological life. It's the zoe, the abundant and full life. And 47 times in the book of John, life is used, that God would come to give life. Yes, we live in this world, and there's despair, and there's death, and and in our culture, we sweep that away a lot. We don't like to look at it or think about it. They saw it much more clearly in, in their culture uh, but Jesus came ultimately for life. And we also get angry at death and are moved by death, but we are powerless to do anything about it. And that's the difference. Living in the tech capital of the world, I often see articles like this one I read on Wired recently that says Silicon Valley would rather cure death than make life 
worth living. And there's been so many uh, ventures out to cure uh, death. Google has a company called Calico, a new startup, where they hope to cure death. And it's a great buzzword. We want to cure death. We're Google after all. But as they look into it, you get more realistic articles that say they would rather cure death than make life worth living. It said, quote, if the titans of Mountain View and Palo Alto are serious about fixing the real problems in the world, they can't just start a new company or make a new app. They should recognize their place as arbiters of culture and lead by example. A video game style quest to end death may appeal to the techie imagination, but it doesn't engage with real problems in the real world. Instead of chasing down death, Silicon Valley could try to help people whose lives are already in free fall. And what promise we have. What, what a message that we have here in Silicon Valley. The message of the gospel. The message of Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. That there is a cure for death already. That death has been cured. It's not something we, 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 a thing that we need to download or, or anything like that. It's a person and that person is Jesus and he has cured death. It has put that last great enemy under his feet. So Christ is angry at death as well and moved by it and the effects that he sees and the people he loves, but he is sovereign over it and the only one who can do something about it. He's the only one that can do something about it. Again, this is a a trailer of coming attractions. And so the Jews said to him, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And verse 37 brings up kind of an essential when tragedy strikes, when this question question 37 could be boiled down to why. Why did God then allow this to happen? It's often asked in times like these, and I would just give some quick advice here to not ask this question when this happens in our life when tragedy strikes to not ask the why don't ask questions we don't know the answer for but ask questions we do know the answers to because we don't have a full answer of why in this life of why the timing on some things or some of the things have we have ultimate answers that God will work things to the good and and it gives life and has life everlasting for us but we should ask questions like this is there hope Yes, there is. In Christ, there is hope. Is this the end? No, this is not the end. Will I see them again? Yes, that is possible. You could see them again. That's the whole point of the gospel, that there is a life to come. There is eternity to come. Can God work good in this? Yes, God can. Every millisecond of your misery, God can work for good. It's not wasted. It's not wasted. God can bring good from it. Even Job, who went through the suffering and the pain that he went through, losing his family and being sick and covered in sores, he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't say ask why. He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And why could he say this? Because he knew that his Redeemer lives. And God is able to work all things to the good. He's quoting Romans 8, 28. Before there was a Romans 8, 28, that God works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So, don't fo- so focus on what you know. Don't focus on what you don't know. And the last point this morning, verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. So, so he's deeply moved again, and he comes to the, to the stone. I think it's pretty clear Jesus was deeply moved. And he says to remove the stone, and Martha, uh, very wise, and, and probably seeing bodies that had passed away before um, in this culture, uh, she says, there's going to be a foul odor. And of course, the King James, King James phrases this uh, the best, that surely he stinketh. Um, is how it phrases it. There will be a foul odor. And in fact, after 72 hours, I was reading about what happens to a body. After 72 hours, it says that the body 
Um, it, it, it actually passes through rigor mortis and is no longer stiff, becomes soft again, and it actually begins to liquefy, except your bones. And, and it, it, it puts off an odor that um, um, if you, you know, people, morticians and such, would say that it stings the eyes. It's just like such a thick odor. It's in the air, and it would sting your eyes to be around it. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? See, there it is right there. If you believed, you would see the glory of God. What if she didn't believe? Would she see the glory of God? Hebrews 11.6 says that we must believe that God is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We start with that He is and He reveals more of who He is. If you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up His eyes and said, Father, I thank You. You have heard me. I knew that You always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that You sent me. I kind of like how He's like, saying this out loud, and he's like, I'm, I'm only saying this out loud for the people that are around so that they would believe. He wants it to be demonstrated. He wants it to be evidential. He wants it to be backed up what he is about to do. Again, that they would believe. This is the whole point of the book of John. In verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. No doubt, it's shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, kum, is the Greek. Come forth. The man who had died, I love this, the man who had died came out. It's really the only place you'll ever read a sentence like this in the Bible. The man who had died came out. Love it. His hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. And this miracle being the capstone of all the signs Jesus has done to back up his words, to back up who he is, being sent by God, bring, raising Lazarus from the dead. After the weeping, after the promise, he's doing it. He is a doer of what he says. He is raising Lazarus from the dead for them all to see calls him to rise. Sure, Lazarus did shine with the rest of his life. This also is, I said, a trailer of coming attractions, a foreshadowing, if you will, of our own resurrection, a foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus. It's also a foreshadowing of salvation. It's a picture of salvation. Romans 6 says that we walk in newness of life as Christians. 2 Corinthians says, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So walk in that newness of life. 2 Peter says that God has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And the picture of this scene, Lazarus in the dark tomb, dead, has been called to life. This is a picture of salvation that God brings. The salvation to the world that he offers and he says, unbind him and let him go. Get those grave clothes off of him. Not going to live like a dead man. He's going to walk in newness of life. And this is what he calls for us as well. That we walk in God's promises. We walk in what God has spoken over our lives and who he's called us to be. We walk in that newness of life. And we prove it out by our walking in it. And I love this miracle because miracle is a picture of salvation. It's also a picture of the ministry that God calls us to because Jesus involves people in this miracle. He involves people. That the movie, he asks them to move the stone. And after he's risen, that, that they remove the grave clothes from him. So he has them do what he's called them to do. And they relied upon him to do what only he could do. 
And that is a picture of ministry, that we do what we are called to do, what we are able to do, what we have time to do. We give of our, our, our treasure and our resources and our time, and we, we expect and rely upon God to do what only He can do, to give life, to restore life, to share the message of eternal life, the hope of eternal life, that though, though someone die, they will live again. And it's not only then. It's now to walk in that newness of life, to experience that life now. So we do what we can do. And we rely upon Christ to do what only He can do. My prayer every week, God, I don't want to, I don't want what's done here just to be stuff that any people could get together and do. God, would you do a a work here at at this church, God, that it's only you can do. It's only what you can do. I will do whatever you've called me to do and do it to the best of my ability and everyone serving, doing everything we can do to the best of our ability. But God, nothing's going to move the needle unless it's you. Unless you do it, but yet you allow us to be part of the mission. Part of the mission. So Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that you have called us to walk in newness of life, God. That you have demonstrated who you are. God, that's the picture that we have here in John 11. That you spoke promise and you also performed to back that up to point to who you were. And that is the offer that we have before us. The offer that promise is spoken to us. One of the greatest is here. That you are the resurrection and the life. That though we die, if we believe in you, we will live again. That's the promise. Do we believe this? And Lord, you will back that up. You will perform. You are a doer of your own word. You never fail and you never falter. And when we are faithless, you are faithful to do what you wanted to do. So Father, I thank you for your word this morning. And I pray, God, that you would give faith this morning. God, that we would walk, that we would trust in you, Lord, that we would start with belief and trust in who you are. And Lord, we would walk in that and we would see you come through and perform and back up and all the promises in Christ would be yes and amen. And when we're 95 years old, if we get there, if the Lord tarries, that we could look back and say every promise, every promise was yes and amen. And I got to to walk with God through this life. I got to know God. I got to experience God. And boom, that transition right into eternal life where the veil is removed. That's all it is, is the transition and the veil removed. And God, I pray that we would know you this morning. I pray everybody in this place, God, would would know of your great love and your grace and your purpose in their life. And this is something only you can do. God, I know it's not these words. It's not anything we could do. Lord, it's only your work that could do this, Lord. And so we thank you, God, for who you are. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll respond through time of worship, the time of being able to give tangibly and through communion this morning. Behold the Father's heart 
the mystery he lavishes on us as deep cries out to deep oh, how desperately he wants us the things of earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun Failing Father, what compares to His great love? Behold His Holy Son, the Lion and the Lamb given to us. The Word became a man that my soul should know its Savior. Forsaken for the sake of all mankind, salvation is in His blood. Jesus Messiah, the righteous died
Mercy falls with the rain. Your powers displayed in the wild ocean. Your presence will always remain. Jesus, your love reaches to the heavens. You are God high above the earth. Angels sing for you, the mountains melt at the sound of your name, oceans roar for you, all of creation gives you praise, for you are God, high above the Jesus, you're all that I need. Here is my life, come and take it from me. Jesus, you make me complete. With you at my side, I can know no boundaries. You are God, high above the earth. Yes, you are God, high above the earth. Angels sing for you. Mountains melt at the sound of your name. And oceans roar for you. Sound of your name, the oceans roar for you. All of creation gives you praise, for you are God high above the earth. Yes, you are. You are God. High above the earth. Oh 
sing those hallelujahs to him. Lift your voice. Stand together for the last one. Lord, no matter what it is we face in this life, you are strong. Lord, we come praising you today, Lord. We come in thankfulness. for the hope that we have in you. There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again victorious. Faithfulness none can deny, and through the storm and through the fire, there is truth that sets me free. It's Jesus Christ who lives in me. You are stronger. You are stronger. Sin is broken. defense. You came to seek and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. Cause you are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen.
So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, you have saved me, it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus you are Lord of all, Jesus you are Lord of all, Jesus you our Lord of all. Amen. 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 Go with the Lord today. Walk with Him. Have a good day.